on it. Okay, so uh, next up we have Rita, and she's going to be talking about some really cool stuff with Kubernetes. So, round of applause for her. Hey everyone, um, I'm Rita. Uh, this is my first Fossum, so yay! Um, so uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, so I know this talk is um, about Kubernetes and gRPC. Um, so I kind of want to talk about why I submitted this talk. Because prior to working on this project, I knew like how gRPC worked in theory, but then I didn't actually saw a lot of like implementation in the wild. So I was like, okay. Um, and then as I looked at this project, um, I realized actually Kubernetes used gRPC quite a bit. Um, so, um, I'm, so just to recap, right? So what is gRPC? Um, well, when I first started, I knew that a lot of people really liked it um, to build. Um, you know, distributed services um, because of its ability to simply define a contract and enable um, developers to sort of have their client application to invoke methods from a server application, regardless of where the application is running, what language you actually write it in. Um, so it's quite powerful. Um, and then I started looking at Kubernetes. Um, and as it turns out, Kubernetes uses this a lot um, in the code base. Um, and one of the actually benefit of it is, um, as, as we just talked about how big the Kubernetes code base is. Um, so one of the benefits of using gRPC is actually um, now Kubernetes can have this one single contract and have all the providers to write the implementation of um, the server side application uh, individually, regardless what language they want to use. And they don't have to all live in the same uh, repository. So that is really, really, really nice for the Kubernetes maintainers. So that's sort of um, what I'm going to talk about. And specifically, I'm going to use the encryption, um, uh, like how, how uh, Kubernetes actually uses gRPC to um, invoke um, external key management services to provide the encryption of its uh, Kubernetes data. Um, so what is key management service? So key management service is um, cloud operated managed service. Um, so you think of your you know, Google KMS, um, Azure Key Vault. So these are uh, sort of managed Key Vault solutions that a lot of enterprises use. Um, it's enterprise grade. And they, a lot of them offer you know, hardware security module uh, protected keys so that um, a lot of the companies can just go ahead and use these managed keys uh, for encryption and decryption. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I'm based out of San Francisco. Um, so I'm still a little jet-lagged. Um, so just bear with me. Um, and um, so pretty recently, I joined the Azure Kubernetes service team. Um, and specifically, my job is to bring like Azure features upstream to Kubernetes. So when you guys run it, run it on um, Azure, you have a good experience. Um, so I'm also uh, the core maintainer for the, the solution that I'm going to talk about today, which is basically the Kubernetes KMS plugin for Azure Key Vault. Um, so maybe let's start with the problem. Like, why do we even do this, right? Um, so I don't know how many um, you uh, use Kubernetes in your, um, in, uh, in your company. <laughs> uh, OK, cool. Um, so I don't know if you remember this happened like pretty much early last year. Um, apparently, some hackers like got their hands on like um, Tesla's Kubernetes cluster, and when they got their hands on their Kubernetes secrets, as it turns out, a lot of people like myself, we actually store our um, cloud uh, credentials as Kubernetes secrets because that's how the cloud providers can actually create resources, whether that's your load balancers or your VMs, or um, you know, maybe like you want to store some of your stuff in S3 or something, right? So this is a very common practice, right? Um, so this is exactly what happened, right? Like hackers got their hands on it, and then they were able to basically use, um, use Tesla's money. Uh, they were basically able to like um, mine cryptocurrency with Tesla's dime. So it sounds pretty cool, right? <laughs> um, no, no, not really. So don't do that. Um, 
So of course now you say, well, how could this even happen? Like this is like enterprise like stuff, right? This shouldn't happen, right? Um, well, let's go to some some of the basics. Like so, what is a Kubernetes database, right? Um, so Kubernetes actually uses SCD to persist a lot of the Kubernetes objects. So think of your secrets, your config maps. They're actually stored in SCD. Um, and and I don't know if you guys know this, but a lot of the contents, specifically Kubernetes secrets, are actually stored uh, as base64 base encoded plain text. So if you look at SCD like just plainly, they're actually stored as plain text. Even though when we when we do kubectl get secret, you can see it. It looks it looks like maybe it's encrypted. No, it's just base64, right? So a lot of people didn't actually know this. Now let's talk about SCD. <laughs> Um, so I didn't know this until like this guy wrote this really insightful um, uh, blog post, and he basically talked about you know out of the box SCD, um, especially before SCD three, um, you know you didn't even actually need like a client cert or key just to like get, talk to the API. Um, so anybody who had access to like your SCD on port 2379 and know the API, like they could pretty much like look at all of your stuff that you're storing in SCD, and that's basically what he did. Um, so he basically did a search on Shodan. Um, so what is Shodan? Shodan is like this crazy search um, engine that basically goes across all the endpoints of popular like um, ports on the internet. And I highly recommend that you do that too, just so that you can see how crazy this, uh, this stuff is. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so in his blog post, he wrote like he did this whole thing, and he wrote some scripts that basically just aggregated all the data that he found. And sure and behold, there's like all these AWS secrets, right? And then you could like not to mention like cloud resources, but these are probably also like confidential like user data, right? Um, so I got curious. I was like, what if I did it myself? Like, would people still, this, are people this, still this dumb? Like, do they still do this? Well, yes. So I did this query like, um, like a couple weeks ago. But basically, I used Shodan to search on 2379. And this is like some poor guy's like cluster. And you can see like this is his like Docker registry keep, like password. So yeah, really scary stuff. Um, so. In summary, right, if an attacker can somehow successfully get to your um, SCD database, whether that's through API or, your C or the SCD CTL, you can pretty much access like, a lot of the data in there and specifically your cloud resources. Now, you might say, okay, this is really, really bad. What, what am I supposed to do? Um, so there are definitely some things you can do to keep your data safe. So as I mentioned before, make sure you're running SCD v3. Make sure you're using like um, client certs and keys just so that your operators ha have those things in place when they actually authenticate themselves. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is the reason why we wrote this thing in, uh, in gRPC is like the community basically came up with like a KMS provider plugin mechanism and it's designed with gRPC implementation such that you can actually use like the latest and greatest like um, enterprise grade level like KMS services that are offered um, you know like by these gi giant companies and you can basically use that to uh, to encrypt and decrypt your data in SCD. So even if your operator actually gets, you know, somehow they get access to the data, it's actually not plain text, it's actually encrypted. And only, only if you have the key, then you can decrypt, right? So let's talk about, like, how, how, does, it, how does it actually work, right? So, um, so let's talk about what happens when you create a Kubernetes secrets. So when you run this command, right, uh, traditionally, what happens is this data basically gets uh, stored in your SCD uh, via the API server. Now, with the KMS provider, what ends up happening is um, instead of like just uh, a, instead of having the API just storing it in SCD, what what it does is it basically f uh, hands off that encryption um, mechanism off to the KMS provider. And as I mentioned earlier, this 
process is written with um, gRPC. So in this case, the API server is the client application. And then the provider, whether that's you know, Google KMS or Azure Kiva or AWS, they all write their own provider. And that provider is, 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 is its, its own implementation. And they can write it however they want, right? As long as we all use the same contract. So once that request is offloaded to the KMS provider, then the KMS provider handles the authentication and the actual encryption and decryp decryption um, methods. And then after that, all that happens, then the uh, encrypted data gets stored in SCD. So here's an example of like what your configuration file looks like. So you basically just have to tell Kubernetes, hey, um, I want to use KMS provider um, as for encryption, and I want and the endpoint for that particular um, plugin lives on this unit socket, right? So this is how you tell Kubernetes um, to use to to talk to this endpoint for the server application. Okay, so let's look at the implementation. Um, so this is the gRPC design, right? And as I mentioned earlier, as long as the server side and the client side agreed upon some contract, the actual implementation, as you can see, can be in whatever language they want. And they don't even need to be on the same uh, machine. And so for this particular solution, what ends up happening is, um, again, the API server uh, acts as the gRPC client. It says encrypt, and then, then it actually invokes the encrypt method in the KMS provider, which, um, which is reachable via the Unix socket. And then the KMS provider then hands off the request to the external KMS, lives in the cloud somewhere. All right. So here are some of the components. Um, as I mentioned earlier, so you have the contract, which defines what the particular, what are the methods that you, what are the APIs that you want to offer, right? Um, and that's defined in this proto, buff, uh, pr proto file. And then you have the server uh, application, which acts as the, as the gRPC server, and then the client code, which in this case is actually the Kubernetes API server. Um, so if, you're, if you want to write your own um, KMS provider, what you end up doing is you basically write a new gRPC server. You define how, how this particular uh, code is supposed to connect to the external KMS. You provide the mechanism to authenticate. You, you tell um, the KMS which keys you want to use for encryption and decryption. And last but not least, expose yourself uh, on that Unix uh, socket. Um, so yeah, so let's look at the code. Uh, I can't find my mouse. All right. Okay, so um, as I mentioned earlier, so inside of Kubernetes, um, this is basically the contract, right? And then as you can see, see here, this is where we define, um, here are the methods that this uh, API, this service should have. And then the same, um, the same contract also lives in, on the, the server side. So in this case, as I mentioned earlier, this um, KMS provider lives completely off of Kubernetes in its own like repo. And as long as the two have the same um, contract, um, they're able to invoke each other. And here is the, uh, and here uh, inside of Kubernetes, this is basically uh, where the API server is, is acting uh, as a um, gRPC client and connecting to that endpoint um, via that socket that we provided in the configuration file. And then once it's connected, um, then it can basically do decrypt and, encry and um, encrypt, and all, all these will basically be triggering um, the, the remote KMS provider. And then here on the, on the server side, you know, on the KMS provider side, um, this is actually what is happening when encrypt is called, and it basically does a handoff to the remote KMS. So yeah. Um, and then this is where the server actually gets instantiated and actually listens on that endpoint. All right. Um, all right, so just 
Um, just to show you like what the data actually looks like. So this is a cluster without um, encryption. So as you can see, um, when I created this secret with kubectl, I said, okay, the value is my data. And then here with the scdctl um, command line, I'm basically able to look at the raw data. And as you can see, it's stored as plain text, and here is the plain text, right? And then here in a different cluster where, um, I, my, where encryption is enabled, um, and as you can see here, it's already enabled, and then it tells Kubernetes where the endpoint is. And then when I ask, when I use SCDCTL to look at that raw data, as you can see, this is uh, encrypted data. All right. So, um, so in conclusion. Um, so this, uh, this again is a demonstration of how gRPC was used inside of Kubernetes to basically offload a lot of the provider specific logic out, out, um, not in tree, but out of tree, right? Um, and then again, the, the nice thing about this is you can um, keep all of the provider specific logic um, uh, separate, separate that from Kubernetes. And this is some links in case you want to check it out. Um, and then just uh, like see how, how it's actually done uh, at the code level. That's it. So we do have time for some questions. So any questions? Raise your hand. I'll come find you. Oh. <laughs> gRPC scares me. How do I debug this? Because it looks like it, like how, I used to see JSON, but there's no JSON. So if I like debug this, what would I see instead? Uh, sorry. So the question was like, how do you debug this? Um, so one thing I do is like, I actually write my own client um, just so that I can look at like all the transactions that's happening. So my unit test actually, like my end to end test actually includes a client. Um, so I'm actually like acting as Kubernetes in this case. Um, yeah, I hope that, I asked you, uh, that answers your question. Really cool uh, presentation. I liked seeing the code examples. One thing I noticed during the code examples is that you have the proto file in both the Kubernetes repo and in the repo of the plugin. How do you keep those in sync? No need to repeat the question. Okay, <laughs> that's a, actually a really good question. And one of the um, like documentation, so like in Kubernetes documentation, this is like telling you how to like write a KMS provider and they literally say take that proto file and like generate your own like service files. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question in terms of, like how to sync it but in theory though like to write one you would have to like get it from source. Um, and one thing that I know will happen is like when we change versions of the thing we will need to like keep that in sync. And so I think the provider will have to do that. Um, it is a contract after all, right? So. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I would like to ask, do you pass the whole data to the KMS to be encrypted? Like the whole content? Or just create a random key in front of it and just encrypt it like a master key? Okay. Um, that's a really good question. Oops. Uh, okay, it's okay. Mm, I wanted to like show you the code. So this actually um, calls the like the Azure Key Vault SDK. And as you can see, it gets the key, um, and then here it it so it's using the key vault cl uh, like Go client to like encrypt, and and um, and then that's the result here. Um, hold on. 
And then here, as you can see, it's the value. Like the data is in the value. So it does, yeah. Sorry? There is an overhead because you're passing the whole content over the net. That's right. Yeah. But yeah. But that's how the how the SDK will handle like that's what it expects. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Nope. Okay, so thank you very much. Round of applause for Rita. Okay, and in 10 minutes, we're going to start with the landing talks. So if you're a landing talk speaker, please calm down and sit there because we're going to go quite quick. Prefer, uh, so do you, do you have? What do you need? I have time. Need something? We can install it here real quick if you want to. Is it something that you get it or? Oh. Uh, I want to run about Instead of this one, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I know how to do that. Uh, yes, everything is going to be on my computer. Uh, uh, so I know you call so to the like rats of dream on two minutes and really rats on one minute. Okay. Alright, uh, go get that. And uh, what is the what is your repo? Yeah, because it's faster. Otherwise, we're gonna have to be switching it again. Cool. All right, so I'm just gonna do a go get on that too. Post them in valid character in the zip. Oh, we don't care. Uh, okay, so now if I do present, is that a thing? Yes. And then we're gonna go to uh, so this. No. Um, Go get this. Alright, so github.com Okay, so that's not there, so RM2 as we want more. That Okay, so that works. Um, and then now I'm going to do a present, and then open that, and then, uh, see, correct? Examples. Cool. Cool. Oh, yeah. This is not the correct Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, when is your talk? You're talking? It, so it's the first one, okay. So let's fix that real quick. Um, slide, uh, so it's uh, an example of this one. And that was Opinia, Opinia, Nade. Let's fix them all. <laughs> Possess, unobstructive, unobstructive. Uh, unobstructive is not a, I think it's a word. Uh, JavaScript, JavaScript is active for, for, for emphasis, function, function, routine, 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 routine. JPEG, you good? Cool, okay. <laughs> no problem. Alright, so uh, then I'm gonna change that with, I'm gonna do the uh, present dot, and then get this, open it instead of the PDF, and then go. Uh, 
Yeah. yeah. And then we can switch with For all of the Lightning Touch speakers, you're going to be using my laptop. I have your slides. Uh, so, except for you because you're special. We know that. It's fine. <laughs> Oh, okay, so I'll say the numbers. I'll actually, I'll start. If you don't mind, just refresh on my side. Yeah, sure. I need your help with something that I'm sure you can help with. Is it? I always, I've mispronounced your name for several years, and I can't do it anymore. Is it Marchi? Marchi. So I, I'm kind of close. Yeah, I accept everything these days. I understand that. It's not about that. Okay, so number five. <laughs> it's about I can't take it anymore for myself. <laughs> but I, even at least make some effort. It's five minutes. Yeah. Okay, so for the Lightning Talk speakers, uh, this is the order we're going to be going. So try, I don't know, do whatever. Like that is the order, and we're going to be starting very soon. We're going to be starting in four minutes. Actually, we might start like two minutes early or something. So um, the first speaker, Rashmi Nagpa. I'm going to need you here. And we're going to start in a second. I was going to say if they're late, I will throw them a gopher. But that one looked dangerous, so no. You can come here. Uh, yeah, that way, even if we start a little bit early, it's totally fine, because that way we have more time, so if you can do so, it's fine. Uh, timer, four minutes and a half. OK, whatever. Cool, so a round of applause for the first talk. Uh, Rashmi, and the slides are here. You can, you can use the clicker if you want. Um, I don't, OK, if you so, want. right, OK. Hi, oh, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rashmi, and I'm a software engineer based in India. So my talk title is Go for the JavaScript Developers. So let's get started. Go is like the sea and the python as a kid. So it's a uh, common saying that Go possesses the confidence and the athletic ability like a sea. And it has the sim good looks and the pleasant demeanor like a python. So what exactly is Go? It's an open source compiled and garbage collected concurrent system programming language, which is blazing fast because it has a young compiler with minimal speed optimization. And also it has a strict compiler. And so it's something like the things like unused imports and the unused variables or hard compiled errors in Go. And uh, it possesses clean and elegant syntax. So what are the similarities between the Go and the JavaScript? So both uses the garbage collection and the variables and the functions, they have a specific scope. And in similar fashions, they define the variable structures and for loops and if statements. What are the major differences between the uh, Go and the JavaScript? So JavaScript is a single thread that it has the main thread, which, has, uh, which does this event loop. And there are several other threads which do the external input output, while in the Go, the concurrence is the king, in the sense that it has the Go routines. And the JavaScript is interpreted language. It runs before, uh, it is, uh, the code is compiled before it runs, while Go is a compiled language. And also in Go, uh, we can have ret uh, multiple return statements. That is, if you have, let's say, an error called uh, 500 internal server error or something like that, particular functions can return the multiple uh, error codes. Or, so it's very consistent, and it's easy to maintain. So basic uh, rules uh, that the lines don't have uh, don't end with a semicolon, and so it's a so a very simple example is declaration of the array of size three, which has integer values uh, one, two, and three, and there is a comma at the end of the three, and the basic uh, types like uh, var num int is equal to five. So, uh, so it says that the variable name that is num it's being declared before the integer uh, the data type itself. Uh, so in similar fashion, the for loop and the while loop, so the, uh, the similarity which we can see in those of them is that they uh, don't have the parentheses. Um, and uh, in the same way, the uh, uh, flow control, that is, there is no parentheses in the if statement. It returns false when the age is less than 18 or 
So what are the uh, so there are some of the advanced features in uh, Go that are the good routines which I already talked before that concurrency uh, is the king in the Go which uh, so the Go routine is basically a lightweight thread which is managed by the Go runtime and uh, so here uh, Go func uh, I mean the function and the ABC are the three parameters. So what happens is the function and the evaluation of the ABC will happen in the same thread itself while the function will uh, the ex the function will be uh, executed in the uh, in the different thread and um, the channels they can be thought of as the pipelines or the pipes like uh, in which the go routines themselves communicate and they also possess a type associated with it that is the data which is allowed to transport through that uh, particular channel uh, and it's being declared using this uh, operator that is a channel operator. Here we can see in an example that channel V. So it's, uh, V is being sent to the channel CH and similar way uh, and how we are assigning the value to the V is, uh, I mean th that channel uh, receive the value from that particular channel and assign it to the uh, variable that is V. Okay, and the personal takeaway is that those who have not yet started with the Go, it's never too late to start something anew all, uh, a fresh, all it takes is pra uh, practice, patience, and perseverance. I really want to thank Carolyn, Rita, and Mathiche for helping me, um, I mean, getting introduced to the Go language, and thank you for inspiring me a lot.